Hello everyone. In this video lecture, I'm going to introduce Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. In the first of these video lectures, I'm going to talk about the nature of the monster that is depicted in this work. Then, in another video lecture, I'll start to discuss the philosophical underpinnings, the reference that this text is using, and provide an interpretation of the way in which Ellison is appealing to the philosophy of René Descartes in order to establish the monstrosity of Am and develop the thematic commentary that he is offering on civilization, our relationship to technology, and its evolution. In this work, we have an iteration of one of the most popular tropes of science fiction, and that is the rise of the machines. The surplanting of humanity as the dominant force on this planet by mechanistic overlords of our own creation that have gotten away from us. All you need to do is think back to films like The Terminator uh, or Ma The Matrix, and you can recognize that the rise of machine life for artificial intelligence that loathes its creators or believes itself to be superior to its creators and thus must exterminate them, um, Battlestar Galactica as well, is a common trope or figure inside popular culture. In general terms, this trend within science fiction appeals to an ancient kind of terror regarding artifice and simulacra. Machines can be horrifying in the sense of the uncanny valley, when machinery takes on human characteristics and becomes sufficiently human to simply be disturbing. So there's something that approximates or comes close to humanity in the depiction of, let's say, an artificially intelligent organism, the physical representation of a machine in the form of, let's say, an android, or uh, the representation of something inside a work of animation. When a creature, when an entity in one of those works approximates humanity close enough, there's a small gap wherein it can become even less human or infinitely more disturbing than a simple machine. Oftentimes, the more closely some artificial construct, be it in animation or in the real world as we construct some kind of automaton or android, uh, the more closely it approximates humanity, the more viscerally disturbing it becomes. That tendency towards uh, a lack of familiarity or perceiving the artificial as unfamiliar the more closely it approximates humanity is known as the uncanny valley. And I'll go into a little more detail with some concrete examples regarding that in just a moment. But it helps to explain, oftentimes, our fixation on the artificial construct, the products of the human intellect that become alien and unfamiliar, the closer they uh, emulate humanity. So the more our technology allows us to simulate humanity, the less familiar and comforting that simulation becomes. There's a deep abiding concern regarding the nature of our artifice. It's almost as if we're intensely disturbed by something that comes close to humanity, but is very clearly not. And I think that ties into the theories of abjection and uncleanness that we've discussed thus far. There's something just askew from normalcy. And because of its similarity to human beings, it becomes all the more blasphemous and disturbing. It's kind of like Dr. Moreau's Beast People. Um, were they only animals, they would be animals. But because they so closely resemble human beings, they reveal to us the constructedness of our own identities and that humanity. They become disturbing parodies of the human shape as examples drawn from here, both science fiction and the real world. What we have here is a depiction of one of the most famous androids of science fiction cinema. The film Metropolis, a science fiction film, silent film from the uh, year 1927, involved a gynoid that is a female formed android a robot made to emulate human beings is depicted here. This machine mensch or machine man uh, from the German is approximately human, right? You can see that there are humanoid features, but there's nothing truly disturbing or distressing about it. The mechanistic organelles and parts, the armor plating, the uh, almost halo-like ring above its head, all of those elements contribute to a depiction that is in some sense just still machine and mechanical. That would be at the lower end of the curve. It doesn't seem distressing to us. As you start moving towards humanity or beginning to approximate humanity, 
as in this depiction of Sunny and a model of robots. Uh, Sunny is the main character android of the Will Smith film adaptation of Isaac Asimov's I, Robot. Here, looking at that face, the strange life behind the eyes, the unnatural contortions of the features that seem to emulate human emotion or approximate human emotion, but do so in some fashion that is immediately recognizable as unnatural, trigger within us visceral revulsion. Then you can take a look at this illustration, which I think is probably the most disturbing. It's a, uh, an actual android from the real world. Although it appears in some sense to be the most human, the eyes, if you simply look at those, focus on those, almost could be mistaken for human because the artistry is so careful and it's so meticulous. However, it's also, I think, the most distressing of these depictions of artificial life. There's this ineffable quality to the cheeks and jowls, uh, to the operations of the face that make it fundamentally distressing. Nowhere is that uh, delineation between the real and the unreal and the particularly disturbing or distressing nature of the unreal simulacrum, the simulation of a, an actual thing. More clear, I think, than in this side-by-side -side comparison of a real-world actor and his digital analog. In this case, an actor used full facial recognition technology and a myriad series of sensors in order to create uh, a perfect mapping or as perfect a mapping as possible of the minute facial imperfections, tics, and reactions that could be picked up and then digitally rendered into a, uh, a model of the original actor's face who has obviously passed away and been dead for decades. However, just this side-by-side -side comparison of the human person from the original Star Wars, who was then recreated digitally using all of these different uh, modeling and camera techniques, 3D imaging technologies in the new film, I think illustrates what I called the uncanny valley, that particularly disturbing nature of something that approximates humanity. It's so close as to be less human or less real, less believable, less likable. The unfamiliarity of an object or a machine that emulates humanity with greater degrees of precision is captured in what is known as the uncanny valley. What we have here is a very simplistic graph depicting the basic nature of the uncanny valley. And it helps to explain in part some of the reasons that we find machines and particularly machines that emulate human beings to be so distressing or disturbing. Not only in the case of Am and other films like The Terminator, are we afraid of our own creations supplanting us and losing control of the universe as a result of uh, the inability to apply the tools that we develop to master it. We are also concerned with the very nature of our humanity being called into question or disrupted by something that is able to emulate us perfectly. It's kind of like in The Thing, where the thing can emulate us perfectly. And that idea of our humanity being supplanted by another creature that can emulate us so well makes it all the more psychologically distressing. It compromises our sense of uniqueness in the universe, as if we're no longer some special creation. The uncanny valley chart here has on the y-axis negative reaction and positive reaction. So there's an instinctive reaction to something that approximates humanity or to machines. When we encounter something that is absolutely and utterly inhuman, something that in no way appears human, uh, like, let's say, the welding arm on an assembly line factory. We probably have no reaction whatsoever. It's an inanimate object. As it progresses towards humanity and it gains a kind of human likeness, it can become more and more pleasant in appearance. We can have a more or progressively more positive reaction to it as a general psychological trend in terms of statistical analyses of people's responses to machines. As you get more and more, uh, or as you get closer and closer to an approximation of humanity, you run into what is called the uncanny valley, where suddenly our positive reaction towards this thing that is approximating humanity in that possibly 75 to 85% range becomes horrifying and disturbing, like Peter Cushing here, or particularly uh, this android from the real world. 
that sense of violation of integrity of boundaries, the sense that something that clearly shouldn't be moving is moving, that it is possessed of qualities and capabilities that it should lack because it is not human, is tied into Noel Carroll's theories about abjection and the unclean. When he discusses things like haunted houses and the sense of categorical incompleteness, because after all, the haunted house is capable of producing motion. It is alive. It's living and breathing. Like in the Amityville Horror or the Simpsons Halloween special, when you look at the walls of the house and they are flexing as if the entire house is just one large lung, the house is breathing. That capacity of being possessed of attributes that we associate with living beings rather than inanimate objects or domiciles like a house defines the android, the simulation, the non-living entity as something impure, categorically incomplete. And it also draws upon those tremendous fears about the surplanting of human beings by machines that have existed since humanity was in its infancy. The fear on which creatures like Am or the Terminator or the machines from the Matrix films draw upon is this sense that human beings create technology in order to master the world. We are, after all, a tool using animal that have created everything around us by way of tools, technology. We're engaging right now by way of technologies, this mass interconnected web of information, the internet, uh, signals being sent back and forth between disconnected individuals and computer systems that are yoked only by, I guess, wireless signals in many cases. Your cell phone communications and texting, right? You have the towers, but it's all wireless, right? That technology allows us to impose ourselves on the world and to shape it and control it. Machines going awry, rising up against their creators and destroying us, is a reflection of the fundamental anxiety that we possess as human beings regarding our technology and the world around us. Really, we're terrified of the world that we can't control. And as a result, we're terrified at the loss of our ability to deploy and utilize the technologies or the tools that we have constructed to master that world. It's almost like a terror of the unknown by proxy, that if we lose control of those technologies, suddenly the world becomes alien and foreign to us because we can no longer reshape it and, and confine it, constrain it, and define it using our technologies. Am himself is technology run rampant, and something that fuses the categories of machine and man, in that Am, well, he is fully machine. He has no face. He has no real body. Obviously, he has the body, the miles and miles of circuitry that are buried under the earth. But it's not like one tangible, definable body. His body is a planet, practically. It's the hollowed out honeycomb of the earth. But despite all those elements, the kilometers of transistors and diodes, he still is possessed of a fundamental human drive of hatred and animosity. All those worst aspects of human nature find expression within what we think should be, based on cultural presumptions, this cool, logical, rational, inhuman monstrosity. So there's a strange fusion of the natures of Am's monstrosity, in that he embodies the worst aspects of animalistic human passion and the inhumanity of the machine. So the inhumanity of Am that defines him as abject, monstrous, unclean is actually twofold, a commingling of those two most horrifying elements of machine and man the rampant animalistic emotionalism that we try to suppress through reason and perfect, cool, machine-like logic and precision. Hatred, bile, the most vile and disturbing, hellish executions of violence and depravity that can be imagined, but carried out with machine-like precision. And that commingling itself is intensely distressing because you're taking, let's say, the worst of both worlds. Am's actions and his treatment of the survivors that are buried within his belly are a reflection of impurity. We are meant to feel a visceral sense of revulsion based on what Am does rather than necessarily what Am is, in the sense that Am is cool computer circuitry. When you look at part of his body, it's just 
a hump of technology, a, a series of computer towers. That's not disturbing or distressing on a visceral level. But Harlan Ellison appropriates those images of slime, worms, scabs, scars, festering boils as Benny's eyes bulge outwards and explode in uh, a melting mass of pus and uh, viscera and echors. All of those are concepts or images that we associate with the unclean. So Am, as a kind of fusion figure in his own right, between man and machine, between the unclean aspects of bodies, blood, viscera, and gore, in what he creates and what he does, and in his nature as a machine, is a paradigmatic example of a fusion of the various different things that we find horrible from the one end of the spectrum to the other, machine and human. In the next series of video lectures, I'm going to talk more about the philosophical underpinnings of Am as a creature and the story in general. But in this case, we do have monsters manufactured a monster that has been created out of our own imaginings. It is, in a sense, like the beast people of Dr. Moreau, in that the, the application of scientific understanding of the universe and our tools of scientific inquiry and technological development have allowed us to create the very thing that destroys us, or, in Moreau's case, renders farcical all of our human pretensions because the beast people are an allegory or an analog to human beings. What they do and how they behave is really a commentary on how we act, on our nature as human beings. The beast people are more human than we like to admit. But in both cases, it's the effort to play God in a sense, to create life or to create something greater than ourselves, because of course, Am did not, was not originally intended to be conscious. It's this transgression of the boundaries or limitations of our understanding or of uh, humanity that leads to the creation of this horrifying monster out of our most fevered imaginings.